Welcome to the Great Bass Tennis Podcast. I'm Steve Smith, episode 128. Bud Schultz, I'm going to get Bud on the phone in a minute. Bud Schultz has a great story. Bud Schultz is a great story. We were talking about D3 tennis. I love D3 tennis because I have so many young students, especially the boys, D1, D1, D1. Bobby Riggs, you just got to be in the game. In D3 tennis, especially the top teams, respectable level of play. But we were talking about Eric Buterak, who's a folk hero from Division Three, Gustavus Adolphus, and we're talking about asking Eric to be on our podcast. We're just talking about it, and I said, "Well, we need to go back a little further," and and talk to Bud Schultz, who played D three tennis, and we'll go through his story. He got to be thirty nine in the world. Uh, I was just telling me earlier that uh, I don't consider him a late bloomer; just someone who took a completely different path. Um, going back to Eric, Buter- Eric Buterak, I uh, just plug in. You know, the, the tennis parents would love this uh, as a talk, a TED Talk. Um, but let's call Bud up um, and just get going because I tease people and tell them, oh, well, it's going to take a little while to get through your story. We start with, uh, with what type of baby food. But let me give him a shout. And I actually talked to his son yesterday, Christo, who I had a chance to spend time with. Christo's the head coach at Brandeis School in Boston, where Bud Collins was the coach. And now Bud Schultz. Oh, Bud. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, we're all good. Bud Schultz. This is going to be great. I appreciate you uh, taking time out of your day to talk to us. Uh, you had a great story. I said you have a great story and you are a great story. With um, Division Three tennis, I mentioned that we have all these kids play D1, 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 and D3 is such a respectable level. And then from there, uh, we can start where, you know, how you got connected in tennis. I've got the, many notes here. Meriden, Connecticut. Um, obviously, there's yep. more before you get to high school, but that you're uh, from the old school where you play a different sport every season. Uh, but tell us uh, your beginning, you know, as a young kid getting into sports. Well, it it was a, it was a funny experience as I look back on it. Um, I didn't play tennis. Uh, I played soccer. I played basketball. I played football whatever was going on at the time. And uh, my mom and dad in the the tennis heyday of the seventies started to play tennis. And um, one summer afternoon, my mom said, come on, you're coming with me. When I was around 13 years old, um, I'm supposed to play tennis and one of the women can't show up. So you're going to fill in. And I thought, oh boy, I hope no one sees me at the, uh, at the public courts where they play. And, and I went and, um, uh, played tennis for the, for the very first time in my life. And, uh, my mom beat me. (laughs) I'm like, Ooh, that's not good. (laughs) Uh, so I, uh, being very competitive, um, by nature, I thought, okay, I'm going to play tennis every day until I could beat my mom. Uh, it took uh, longer than than I had hoped. My mom was a pretty good athlete. She's been playing tennis for for a number of years now. And then when I finally beat her, I'm like, okay, now I'm going to set my sights on my dad. I'm going to play every day until I can beat him. And within a matter of months, I was just absolutely hooked absolutely hooked to be able to, uh, you know, the concept of both movement, but also, also the, the hand eye was everything that I loved about soccer, about basketball, about, uh, football all in one. Um, and from that point on, uh, there was hardly a day growing up unless I was in another, you know, unless I was in basketball season that I didn't play tennis. No formal coaching, really, to speak of. You didn't not the traditional path where you're taking lessons every week. No, no. Um, you know, when I was 
15 years old, Steve, I got a job cleaning courts at a local indoor club. And uh, they uniquely to clubs back then had a video machine. And it was a reel to reel video. And there was another kid at the club that was already a pretty accomplished player. Uh, and he and I would clean the courts in exchange for court time. And we would set the video machine up and video ourselves. And, you know, at the time I said, I thought, okay, I want my backhand to look like Vita scarolitis. And we would go, we would hit for 20 minutes, go up and look at it on tape, go on back down. And it, and it was really just mimicking what we saw the pros of the day doing. Um, and we, the two of us sort of coached each other a little bit, but it was really look at it, look at yourself, go back, do it again, you know, uh, and just trying to copy what we were watching on TV back in the day. Uh, Vetus was so fun to watch. I used to do a drill. We, used to, we should go back and still call it Vetus. Just having kids square out in a good ready position, hit a volley, forehand volley, another a backhand volley in an overhead and just... Because he was so good at just getting organized in between points, but so obviously he was someone oh. that was great to watch. He was so fast. Yeah, and, and just such great balance and uh, and efficient in his energy and movements. Yeah, and he wasn't that much older than you, correct? I mean, um, so he was he was probably at that point, you know, six or seven years older. I think, I think he was born in fifty four. Uh, yeah, so I was fifty nine, so five years older, right? And but he, he was he was on the world stage. I was in right, America, right, right, right. <laughs> did you? Uh, I know we'll get to go into this, but did you get a chance to play and practice with him later on? When you uh, on never did. I I I met him a number of times, and um, um, you know, one of one of our fond memories is my locker was next to him one year at Wimbledon, um, and just. What a delightful man. Yeah. Uh, you told me that for one week, uh, Meriden, not too far from Wallingford, when Welby Van Horn's camp was at the Choate School, and I, I worked there, but I mm-hmm. was a few years after you were you were there as a 13-year-old. Do you have any memories from being with Welby for just one week? Um, I, I remember thinking with the exposure of that one week and Welby and some of the demonstrations that he did, I remember thinking, this is what I want to do. Um, he, and, and it was interesting in the sense that, um, I saw him do some things with a tennis ball that I had no idea were, were physically possible. And he, was able to articulate a pathway to be able to do it. Um, and it was, it was, you know, my parents were, were incredibly supportive and, and that one week at the Welby Van Horn tennis camp was sort of a, a, you know, a carrot that my parents put out in front of me. You know, if you continue to work hard, we'll do this for you for that one week. Um, and I just walked away um, more in love with the sport than even before. Um, but, you know, seeing someone at the highest level of the game, Steve, I think is, is you know, what I tell parents all the time is worth a thousand lessons. You, know, you want your kids to really fall in love with the game. Take them to a pro event and, and let them watch because they'll walk away just mesmerized by, you know, what the pros can do with a tennis ball. No, for sure. And, uh, I, I, think, that, I think exposure, you know, we go through the five E's, uh, you know, it's got to be enjoyment. It's not hitting giggles. And the next is education. Next is experience, exposure, environment. But yeah, mm-hmm. Billie Jean King, you got to see it to believe it. And, you know, the top pros, yeah. I mean, they're just effortless too. I mean, as far as they're not muscling yeah. the ball and there's so many things you can pick yeah. up being so close. Yeah. yeah. So with, uh, so obviously you had to cut it down to two sports. Uh, basketball, was that your number one love, or, or was it just a toss-up between basketball and tennis? I mean, how did soccer uh, not become one or two? Um, you know, I was, I was all state in soccer. Um, basketball, 
though, you know, the, the town I grew up in, Meriden, is, you know, 60,000 people, 59,000 blue collar, you know, workers. And basketball was a really big deal. Um, we had a lot of kids um, that, um, you know, all summer long, that's where they'd hang out on the basketball court. And it was a community um, that was wonderful to be around and to be in. Um, so I absolutely loved it. And um, my girlfriend in high school's father was the basketball coach at Wesleyan University, which was the next town over in Middletown, Connecticut. And, um, you know, when he started talking to me about where I was going to school, he said, you know, I don't, I don't think you really want to be coached by me in the next town over. Um, but where else have you applied? And uh, he gave the Bates basketball coach a call and uh, helped me help, uh, you know, grease the wheels for me going up to Lewiston, Maine and Bates College. Um, but it, so, so it was a bit of a, a conduit, but it was also during the winter when tennis court time was, was a little more scarce. Um, uh, it was a, it was a wonderful, wonderful passion. You know, back in the day, uh, certainly Massachusetts was a hotbed for hockey, but when I was a kid, Connecticut wasn't, I mean, now hockey's really popping up everywhere. Yeah. But yeah. But when I was a kid, basketball would have been number one in Connecticut with, um, yeah. When you were a basketball player, six four, were you a forward or guard? You know, we. I was lucky because I was I was a, a what they call a tweener. Um, if the other team um, put out a lineup where uh, they were bigger, um, I would play guard. If they had a lineup that was a little bit smaller in, in height and size, then I would play forward. Um, so we had the ability to play almost like a three guard system or a two guard system based on, so I was the lucky one on the team where I always had the mismatch. I had either had, a uh, you know, a guard that was generally a little bit smaller than I was, or I had a, a forward that was guarding me that was, was never going to be as quick as I was. So I was the beneficiary of a, of a, um, sort of flexible, uh, style of play by our coach. You know, I tell kids today, and unfortunately, I don't think enough of them watch sports on TV, but I would say, all right, get in here, especially the teenage boys, the most unmanageable animal in the mall. I used to be one. <laughs> and say, hey, if you, were, if you were a football player, they wouldn't choose you to be the quarterback, or if you were a basketball player, they wouldn't choose you to be a, a guard. But I think, that's right. just, I think it's just one more example of how you were challenged with adversity, though. That might be the wrong word, but the complexity is to play a sport where you have to play for both forward and guard. Nowadays, I don't think kids play more than one sport. Most of the kids I work just play tennis and they start at early age. I do think the old Soviet system where they, you, they wanted you to master two sports and they didn't include mm -hmm. gymnastics that everybody started with. But I think basketball mm -hmm. is the best transfer sport because for many factors, but one, you know, you can do solo drills, but then you can play one-on-one, -on -one and there's a hoop in the driveway. There's public parks. It's not very expensive. Right. And I just think every tennis right. kid, left foot, right foot, forwards, backwards, they should be dribbling basketballs in between and out the cones and such. And um, Yeah, yeah. Because it's such, it, it just challenges and it, it, the change of directions. Why don't you just elaborate upon that, the similarities between footwork and basketball and tennis? Yeah, it it. it forces you to, you know, the, the very first thing they teach you when you, when you start playing basketball is, is, um, the balance, a balanced position and playing low to the ground, playing low, um, lateral movement, moving forward, moving back. Um, I've always thought that my basketball training was, um, you know, really the foundation to the way I moved on a tennis court and particularly because I had an aggressive, uh, uh, forward moving style of play. Um, it, it dovetailed directly into the movement of basketball. Um, so it, it, uh, you know, it, there were other things too because where I grew up, it, there were a lot of there were a lot of rough neighborhoods and, and rough kids, 
and it teaches you a competitiveness and, and an ability to, to keep your head when, when things around you aren't going as you'd like. Um, and it, it really gave me a physical and a mental toughness, particularly growing up playing basketball in Meriden that, um, I thought was, as I, as I got into the pro ranks was a huge advantage. Um, there wasn't much that was really going to phase me on the tennis court. You take um, took a few, and, elbow, took a few elbows to the face. Oh yeah. A few elbows. <laughs> and, um, you know, you play, you play in the public parks and, uh, you know, we would play all day and all night and there's no referees. Um, so, you know, you just, you just keep playing. And, you know, so when some of the veterans on the tour gave me a, gave me a screwy look or, you know, tried to intimidate you a little bit with this, that, or the other thing, I would, I would always internally chuckle and they think <laughs> I've, I've seen a lot worse than this boy. <laughs> I think what you said too is no referees. I mean, that, that doesn't exist. The, the, the background or the, the backyard, the pickup sports. Yeah. I was in Tampa for 15 yeah. years. Your son, Chris, who spent time with us there. And I haven't done this in a long time, but I used to take three guys and we would go to the, go to the park and you wait in line and then they would play three on three basketball. And the thing was, is the, the tennis kids I would take, they would get beat, but we would just sit there and watch until they, they got a ter- turn to play again. And just to yeah. sit or, and watch those athletes and the competitiveness. And I always like the trash right. talking. I don't think there's enough trash talking in tennis. Uh, <laughs> you know, too, too many moms and dads climbing the fence. But let's backpedal oh, about yeah. you, you, when you say all state yeah. in playing soccer, was that in high school? Yeah, in high school. And um, then I was sort of late to basketball. I always played basketball, but um, my sophomore or between my my junior year in high school, uh, I tore the meniscus in my knee uh, playing soccer and then had surgery on it. So I missed that basketball season. So I really only had one full year um you know, playing varsity basketball in high school. The idea that you could make the varsity team as a sophomore was a real stretch, uh, just based on the community level of basketball play. Um, so I really only had one year um, of basketball, but it was just well, yeah, as our, much. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry to interrupt. But for our listeners, I always say, if you're on a college campus, go to watch intramural basketball. And it is a high level. I mean, it's so difficult to play basketball beyond high, yeah. behind high school. It's like, you know, yeah. Mike, Michael Jordan, the story was when he got cut as a sophomore in high school. But people don't know that every night the coach was in his driveway. He just wanted him to get more playing time. I've, right. co- I've coached so many kids that have been a freshman in high school, and they're, they're number one in the school. I mean, we're, we're pretty much a private niche sport compared to basketball. Right, right. With um, and going to Bates, um, I tell our listeners the first time you won a pro tournament, you're climbing the ranks. And I was in Tyler, Texas, running this program for tennis teachers, and I watched it, watched you play, watched the finals. And you know, people, I'm from the Northeast, so I said, well, "This guy went to Bates." I'm thinking, "No way, Bates is in Maine." And you know, <laughs> and then, uh, then he, and he played basketball. Uh, so you. I have down here, you chose Bates academics, but you, you, when you went there, you knew you could play both sports. Yes. Yes. So, so, uh, w- you know, one of the many, many, uh, things that I sort of lucked into was the basketball coach at Bates was also the tennis coach. Uh, this wonderful, wonderful man, George Wigton. And, um, so, when my girlfriend's father called him and said, Hey, I got this kid. He's going to play for you. Um, if you, if you help him get in and, uh, Oh yeah, he plays tennis too. And, um, he said, well, that's good because I'm also the tennis coach. So this was a, a father figure who, uh, I literally saw every day that I was in college. And, um, um, you know, it was a shortened season because it is Maine with the tennis. We would play some of our matches, uh, 
in, <laughs> in snow, literally with it snowing outside. Um, but because I could just transition straight from basketball into tennis, and because it was the same coach, he, he really helped pave the way for me to find success in the tennis up there as well. Yeah, there are people from the Northeast, you're from Connecticut. Did you, you play high school tennis as well? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So you, you, in, the, uh, in the spring, the weather is absolutely brutal when you play high school tennis in the Northeast. Yeah. You start yeah. in March. It, and... uh, but uh, you know what? I, uh, you know, Steve, I never played a junior tournament, not a single junior tournament. Um, and part of it was I just wasn't, I wasn't good enough at that point. Um, and another part of it was I really – because I had no coaching, because I was self-taught, because of, you know, from where I grew up, there was no history of kids in Merritt and Connecticut going off and playing junior tennis. Um, it just wasn't something I was really aware of. You know, I would play local town tournaments, um, but I never played a junior tournament in my life. So um, I, I, wasn't recruited by a single school anywhere in the country for tennis. Why don't you talk about tennis in the seventies? It boomed because the tiebreaker, James Van Allen, uh, tennis could finally be on TV and w what an era that you played in. Uh, but yeah. in the seventies, I mean, you go to the courts and you'd have to wait for a court and, and all the athlete, yeah. all the athletes were trying tennis. I remember practicing with a kid who was a really good baseball player and said, this is great to try just try to return this lefty serve because he's a baseball player right. and he really had a good serve but yeah talk a little bit about right. the 70s there was everybody was playing everybody it wasn't like today yeah yeah it, you know we had a couple public parks in in Meriden that had some really nice uh tennis courts and there was a community of people that that were always there um and I'd go to the park and you'd wait for your turn. You'd play this guy or that guy. And, you know, one guy was 45 years old. And as I told you, I had a, another buddy in town who was a pretty good player. We would go up there and we would play. And so we were with all sorts of different people. We were with all different ages. And the common denominator is you could play tennis reasonably well and you were competitive. And you would learn to play against all sorts of different styles, all sorts of different personalities of player. And the and we were lucky in the fact that the older guys that were within this community saw that we were pretty good and that we were really into it. And they they embraced us and they brought us along and they they brought us into their community. And it was it was a wonderful way to to learn how to play, to learn how to be an adult, to learn how to be competitive um again one of those things that i feel really lucky about yeah this, i think it's it's certainly it's certainly gone away where yeah to be like a, to be around adults help you helps you act like an adult but the the youth versus veteran match i say that you know the mushroom the guy with the pot belly and the, he's mm -hmm. got he's got the you know the the mushroom cap <laughs> he's got a band around his elbow and, <laughs> and he takes a roll of the spoiler and you know, that type of player can really beat so many, so many juniors. I think so many kids today, they're just back right. trying to blast ground strokes and they don't develop yeah. an all court game. When did you go right. from a wooden racket uh, to beyond? It was, I want to say my junior year in college. Um, you know, the Prince racket had, had sort of exploded. Um, I want to say, you know, one of the reasons was when Pam Shriver um, made the finals of the U.S. Open. What was it? What was she? Sixteen years old, and she was yeah. she was using that that big, you know, Prince metal racket. Um, and somewhere in there, I, I switched over to to metal racket. No, we'll, uh, I've got that in my notes. We'll talk about Pam. I know you spent some time working with her. With uh, Bates, yep. 40,000 people in Lewiston, Maine. How big a school is Bates enrollment? Uh, when, I, when I went there, it was only uh, 1,400 kids. Um, it's a little bit bigger now. It's a little over 2,000 kids now. But, uh, uh, you know, 1,400 
kids and I would say half the school played a sport. Um, it was pretty rigorous academically and, um, it was, it was a good place for me to quote unquote, grow up and mature a little bit. Steve. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, Small classes, people looking out after you and making sure you told the line. Yeah. The teacher student ratio, there's no, no place to hide. I you know I went to a, a prep school where it was, a, it was actually in Merritt in New Hampshire. It was uh Kimball union as well. Yeah. 300, yeah. 300 students and 300 residents in the community. Uh, yeah. Three-time All-American in tennis, then All-New England in basketball. Um, mm -hmm. Pretty tough to be a student athlete to combine both studies and sports. You know, I, I, I was lucky enough to be a good student. Um, didn't mean that I loved it. Uh, and... I was that kid in high school that sat by the window and looked out at the ball fields and, and got through the classes and did. I was again, I was lucky enough to to be a good student, but my interest was out on the ball field and uh, far less so in the classroom. Uh, so, on some level, you know, going to school was was a means for me to continue to to play sports and compete and um, do what I what I really loved, um, which was playing basketball and tennis. But going from college to pro, I have in my notes, read where in, in 81, you went to BU for a year, to grad school. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, and I remember watching the Australian John James play. I have down here where yeah. uh, you, yeah. you played him in a local money tournament. And he, and he said, you know, get out there. And you, you, your response was out where? Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So they, they had a number of, uh, small money tournaments around New England and then all the best players would play. Um, this was a year after I graduated from Bates and I was in graduate school at Boston University and working with the tennis team there. And um, I played him in one tournament and lost to him 7-5 in the third. And, uh, if anyone knows John James, he, he was not the most talkative guy. He was very nice, but... Uh, very quiet man didn't say anything and then a couple of weeks later I play him again lost to him like seven six in the third and at the time he had just retired from the tour and was still ranked like you know a hundred in the world and he's looking at me he goes who are you and where did you come from I've never heard of you and so I told him a little bit about my background and, and he said you know you really need to get out there and I honestly I, I say this with all honesty. I had no idea what he was talking about or what that pathway was or even how to start going about it. Um, so, but that, that was where the seed was planted, Steve. Um, you know, my, my initial thought was, geez, maybe I could, maybe I can delay getting a real job and, and keep hitting a tennis ball for a while. So. I'll check your memory. Uh, when he played you, was he using his golden Yonex racket? He was. He was. You know, I remember watching him play. My, I, I, would be, I would be guessing on this, but I think people said, whatever you do, don't hit to his forehand. Was that right? He had a really big forehand. Uh, Might have been a big backhand. It, it, he, you know, the way I remember it is he could do everything really well. But... Um, I do remember when a point was critical, he seemed to be able to find a forehand to hit. And um, the other thing I remember is, as good as he was from the baseline, once again, when the, there was a critical moment in the match, he would find himself. He would find his way up to the net, and um, it, it was quite a lesson in understanding how you know, distance or lack of distance for your opponent can create pressure and, and opportunity. You know, um, people he, was, to, he was wonderful to watch. Yeah, he was wonderful to watch. People come to see me for, for technique, but really in the end, I think it's all about character. I love to read about tennis, but more not seeking technical information, but just character. Uh, Colin Dibley was a police officer. He had a huge serve and practiced with Rod Laver, mm -hmm. played and Laver told him, you need to get mm -hmm. out. Same story. You need to get out on the tour. Yeah. With um, 
I, I remember watching you play. My memory is that you serve and volleyed both balls. Of course, it was on a hard court yeah. when I saw you win. That, is, that, is that right? You were all over the net? Yeah. 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 Come forward. Um, and, you know, one of the, one of the things, and I, I suppose I learned some of it from basketball, is uh, in a tennis match, you can create a cumulative pressure. Um, and I may lose a first set, but I'm going to keep coming forward. And at some point in the second set, I'm going to start finding cracks in your game as a function of you just being starting to be mentally tired uh, of the pressure that I keep um, uh, providing <laughs> to you. And, uh, that, you know, generally in a third set, that pressure gets to the point where, um, a lot of players just don't want to deal with it anymore and they sort of go away competitively. Um, but the concept of cumulative pressure was always a, a significant part of my style of play. Uh, one thing on the UTR, you know, the kids know if they lose more than six games, they're, even if they win the match, if they lose more than six games, there's a chance their UTR could go down. And uh, I think years ago, people would say, I can win this match. And I can, I can experiment a little bit in the first set, try, try some different patterns, try to go forward. Mm -hmm. But I think that's one of many reasons um, why people don't go to the net. I, I want to spend more time on the pro tour, but let's jump ahead where um, uh, your, your thoughts, you know, you were telling me with, your coach, and I'll ask you about Bill Drake and also Eric mm -hmm. Udrak. You're saying how, how the game's taught. Why don't we just jump in on that as far as, you know, starting at the net and working backwards and teaching the volley first. I mean, is that a good start? Yeah. Is that what you have to say on that or more? Yeah. It, um, you know, I, I, I personally think one of the, one of the reasons we don't see uh, competent volleyers in today's game the way we the way we did back in my era, in part, is the way the game is taught. The game is taught uh, generally with a full swing, and then at some point down the road, um, we bring someone up to the net and say, "Okay, now you can't swing." Well, we just taught you how to swing, and we've ingrained this full ranging motion. Uh, now we're saying. Okay, let's cut that down to about you know ten percent of what it was, and it's just completely counterintuitive to people. Um, so I've always thought that the game should be taught from the net back, not from the back of the court forward. Um, let's teach kids how to how to volley first, and then we because conceptually with no swing, it's actually something that's easier for kids to do to make contact with the ball and to move, keep the racket up front, all these, all these really good fundamentals, and then build a longer and more full swing from that. Um, and I think uh, now uh, you get a kid who's 12 or 13 years old who's gone through that progression, and you've got a tennis player that can play all parts of the court. And, and, will have a comfort level with being at the net and consequently will be more open to various strategies of, of playing the game and in particular moving forward. Um, yeah. And if you don't and, do it early, you're not going to develop the instincts. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and you know, Steve, one of the things that I talked about my coach all the time is that even if you're a baseline, it's a forward moving game. <laughs> right. So, I may start the point, uh, you know, 10 feet behind the baseline to return, but ultimately as I can move forward up onto the baseline, I'm creating uh, an advantage for myself. So even as a baseline or it's a forward moving game. You know, I'm probably, probably the worst basketball player of all time, but driveway basketball, PE basketball. But I remember even playing, you know, like the late Tim Gullickson was a good basketball player. I remember playing a game with, yeah. and it was like, you know, I was just not going to shoot. I was just going to stay between the man and the basket, beat Charlie Hustle. But in basketball, I always, and we don't do that so much anymore. You could just, there's so many things like people going back for an overhead as like a quarterback, making the crossover steps, dropping back in the pocket. Yep. 
But in basketball, yeah. I'd say, okay, the, the play, the guard bringing the ball up the floor is very much premeditated, like the baseliner. But when you, look, you get onto the boards looking for a rebound, I mean, I think that's you know, more like it is at the net for a volley. Right, right. And then right. also, too, uh, kids today, if they, I mean, certainly don't develop the instincts, but they don't bend and jump. You know, you could, you know, obviously when you played, I mean, from basketball, you know, you could, you could get down low, play the volley, especially if you like Garolitis. I mean, he was so good at that. What an image that he gave right. for low volleys. Right, right, right. With, uh, tell us a little bit about your progression. Um, you played in the tour seven years and the climb to be 39. Um, have down here, you beat five. Um, you played all the majors. You beat five top ten players. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us a little about your climb because you, you you got out of Bates, then you went to BU for a year. So did you play during that year? You were in grad school. Yeah, so I was I was the graduate assistant for the for the tennis team, and there was a guy on the team by the name of Bob Green, and he um, no, I remember was Bob one Green. of the top. Yeah, he was one of the top players in um, in New England college tennis, and uh, he had gone and played a satellite uh, between his junior and senior year, and came back and and had gotten a couple points, uh, ATP points, and um, so I was able to practice with him all the time and a couple other guys on the team. Um, um, but most importantly, during that period, I was introduced to my coach, Bill Drake, and I played in a local pro-am that had a fair amount of money in it. And uh, I played against him, and my partner was, was probably the least talented player in the event, but I was playing Bill Drake and his partner, who were the number one seeds, and I was jumping all over the place, cutting balls off and doing things that... Um, as Bill said later, I hadn't seen any tennis player do these things. Um, and it was sort of, you know, a basketball player playing tennis at that point. Um, and, you know, again, the comment of who are you and where'd you come from kind of thing from him. And he asked me to uh, play with Barbara Potter, who was top 10 in the world. Bill Drake was coaching her and she was about to leave for Wimbledon. I came and played a few practice sets with her. And, um, afterwards I, I said, you know, look, I'd love to chase this dream a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, any chance you'd coach me? Um, and, uh, uh, he said, look, if you want to, if you come work for me this summer, um, I'll spend some time with you on the court. And that was, that was the start of, uh, what was a, a phenomenal relationship. Uh, you know, under his tutelage, I went from 10 in New England to 39 in the world. So that's sort of where it started. Um, about a year or six months after that, I went out, started playing some, some satellites. And, um, it was a, a two and a half year progression to, before I got up into the, into the main, uh, tour. Um, and you know, it just, it just takes time, Steve. It takes a, a lot of losses, uh, some wins along the way and showing up every day and thinking, how am I going to get a little bit better today? Um, one of the one of the things that that I did recognize pretty early on, especially starting out at the lowest level of pro tennis, was that there weren't a lot of guys that really wanted to put the time and effort that was necessary into it. Um, they were all very very good tennis players, but I was thinking about how hard do I need to work to to uh, keep getting better every day. Um, there weren't a lot of those guys out there. No, it's a compliment. Your son, Christo, say my dad is such a blue collar guy. I mean, lunch bucket mentality, just to outwork people with, um, what about the financial side? I mean, that the war mm -hmm. of financial attrition is, you know, if you're playing a say minor league basketball, mm -hmm. basketball, minor league hockey, 
you know, you're not paying for the bus, you're not paying for the plane, you go to the restaurant, the team covers mm-hmm. the tab, the mm-hmm. hotels. What about the mm-hmm. struggle financially to, to go from the role of starving artist to being on the main tour? Well, I was very lucky to have been introduced to a guy by the name of Carl Greenman, who put a group of friends together and at the time it, it was I estimated that it would be about 15 grand a year to stay out on tour it's obviously a lot more in today's world but so this group gave me fifteen thousand dollars and the way I proposed the deal to work was I would use that money and if I started to make money at the point that um, you know I had, $30,000, we'd make a distribution. Uh, and the distribution would be that they would get 10000 and I would get five. Uh, and then when that happened again, they would get seven and a half, and I would get seven and a half. And when it happened a third time, um, they would get five, and I would get 10. And now I've got my fifteen thousand dollars to go off on my own, and they would get their original fifteen grand back, and they've doubled their money. Um, the chances of it ever happening were one in a million, and these guys all knew that they were putting their money behind me to chase a dream. Um, and again, you know, another group of people in my life that I'm, that I'm forever grateful to. With uh, um, with Bill Drake, did he, you know, were you out there most of the time on your own, or did he travel some with you? He would come to the slams with us. He he assembled a group of guys uh, that he coached. That you know, and again, one more lucky situation I found myself in. Um, he coached this guy Bob Green, who got to you know around fifty in the world. Uh, he coached another guy by the name of Glenn Laird, Leyendecker, who played at Yale. Uh, and he got to about 70 in the world. And then the real stud in the group was this guy, Tim Mayot, <laughs> who right. people will recognize. And, you know, he got to, t- he was top 10 in the world, played Davis Cup, semifinals of Wimbledon. Um, but Bill Drake coached all four of us. And, um, you know, it was the ultimate rising tide raises all ships because um, we'd come to practice every day and, you know, beat the hell out of each other. And um, we all had a similar mindset in terms of work. Um, we all enjoyed each other, traveled with each other. And it was uh, it was a wonderful way to, to uh, get better every day. I know that so, Bill... Um I mean, his son, Chris, became a great player. He's a coach at Yale now. Yeah. Did yeah. he also coach juniors, or did he just coach pros? He well, So at the time, he was the director of tennis at the country club, where they just had the U.S. Open golf. Um, and he, we, we talked to him at one point and said, hey, would you come out with us full-time on tour? And he politely declined and said, you know, there are a couple of factors. One, what am I going to do? when you guys are done and that's, you know, that's a limited period of time. Uh, but more importantly, and this was interesting that uh, I've referenced many times once I retired from tennis and got into teaching and coaching, but he said, you know, coaching each level of tennis presents a different challenge. And it, I only had one challenge, just teaching beginners, I get bored. If it was just intermediates, I'd get bored. If it was just you guys, eventually I would get bored. And it's the challenge presented teaching all of those levels and creating a, a continuum of a, of a pathway for people that keeps it interesting and, and keeps it fun for me. That was him saying that. No, it's very um, interesting. I think a lot of touring coaches and, have not really been in the trenches coaching beginners. They skip the several steps and go right to the top and are, are coaching players yeah. who can already play. We call it, the, we call it yeah. sometimes we call it the third base coach, the kid who's already about to score. But if you're coaching on a tour, you're coaching people who have already scored. Right, right. And there, there are things that, that I've taken coaching beginners and intermediates in my life. I, 
you know, work with, with a number of pros. Um, I think there's a education to it that helps you be a better coach, um, coaching at all levels. So, oh, but I've always, I've right. always remembered him saying that. Uh, so he didn't, he didn't travel with us. With, uh, I read we had, had the privilege of losing to seven international hall of famers. Uh, I've got their names down. We could do a lightning round. I mean, with, uh, mm-hmm. what comes to your mind with when you played Connors, what about Jimmy Connors? Um, I love playing Connors because he hit a low flat ball and, um, I was always better with a ball at waist height or below. <laughs> so he would always, he would always look at me and go, how come you always play me so tough? And I would just smile and go, I don't know, Jimmy, you know, maybe I just get up for you. But the reality was I knew I was going to play him well because every ball that he hit was right in my, in my, uh, my sweet, sweet spot. So I always played him well. Amazing tennis player, Jimmy Connors. What about McEnroe? Yeah. Comes to your mind. Uh, so he, he clear, you know, I'm not the first one who said this, but he was an artist. And there were things that he saw on a tennis court in terms of angles, in terms of timing. And what I mean by that, he would take balls early or late that was that was uniquely different than anyone else you would play. There was a consistency to other players, and he would make you uncomfortable by sometimes um, unexpectedly taking time away from you, or in other situations. And, and this this may sound a little odd, but by by all of a sudden you've got a little too much time after he's been pressuring you for a while. So it was it was a herky jerky experience playing him. Um, but he saw things on a court that other people didn't see. And, you know, I laugh because even if I did see some of the angles that he saw, I couldn't execute it. But he not only saw it, um, but could also execute it. Um, he was, uh, in my experience, he was, he was the most uniquely talented player that I ever played. Friend of mine, Jim Martz, he owns Florida Tennis. And last time I talked to him about it, he, he had, hadn't published it, but he's writing a book on things that Arthur Ashe said. And I'm flattered that he would call me up and say, tell me some things Arthur Ashe said. And he said about Jimmy Connors is, is no, he's going to just take, take the knife right through your heart, but McEnroe is going to torture yeah. you with taking a sl- yeah. slice here and a chop here and a chip yeah. here. And he's just going to cut, cut you to pieces. Um, yeah. Yeah. I had this in my notes. Let's let's save this one for a little bit later. Um, I love your story about Ivan Lendl and ball hockey. But what comes to your mind? I know you spent a lot of time with Lendl. But what's, what's the first thing? First couple of things come to your mind on Lendl? Uh, you know, he 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 famously said, "I'm not the most talented, but I'm the most talented worker." And uh, you know, I would go down and train with him at his house, and, and um, his level of discipline and his willingness to work harder than anyone else, even as he's number one in the world, um, was, was what a lesson and boy, it was stunning to see and to watch, um, you know, at the time when the world of fitness for athletes was was changing pretty quickly he was the fittest guy he was the fittest athlete in the world um and he structured his entire world around being that um it was it was really impressive and and fascinating to watch and to learn from i one time was in Asheville, north carolina lost in duncan real as you know real quiet guy and yeah rainy day and so no indoor courts and so we're just indoors you know, coaches, parents, and players talking about tennis, and and uh, it was great. I just said to Lawson, "Tell us about practicing with Lendl." And uh, then people said afterwards they had never heard Lawson talk so much. <laughs> you, know, you know, get up and ride the bike twenty miles and play. You play yeah. uh, the food. The food would be prepared, and then you play five sets. Yeah. You know, he had his own wall to climb up, and then with uh, taking a nap and then playing another five sets, so two five set matches yeah. in one day. How about uh, Boris Becker? Uh, 
You know, I played him for the first time when I was 21 and he was 15. And it was in a qualifying event for us, qualifying just to get into a, a satellite of, uh, tournament. And um, I had already won five matches in the qualifying. And I had to play him in the last round of qualifying. And I'm thinking, there's no way I'm going to lose to a 15-year-old. And um, he came out and just routine me, for, you know, four and four, one break a set. And it really wasn't that close. What, what, what surface thinking, was that on? It was indoor, indoor, indoor carpet, indoor carpet over in Germany. And uh, I just remember thinking, that's, that's a level of play I hadn't seen yet. Um, and he was still young. But uh, he was already big, and and he already at the age of fifteen had this confidence that just screamed, "I belong, and I'm going to be great." Um, yeah, for all of our listeners, and I was, go ahead. Yeah, and I just remember thinking, "What am I doing out here? I can't beat a fifteen-year-old." But lo and behold, he ended up being pretty good. Yeah, I mean, two years later, when Wimbledon, uh, right? Um, what's the name of the Australian coach? Jake's. Uh, he was coaching Steve Denton. And, uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, he, um, he uh, was all over Denton's case. It's a fun story where Denton had beat him six and six. <laughs> and it, and the, Denton said, hey, coach, he's good, he's good, he's good. And, and uh, he, was, he was only 17. And then uh, Denton felt better because the next tournament out, he won, uh, he won Wimbledon. Yeah. Well, I have to laugh because that same trip to Germany to play the satellite circuit, the following week, in the last round of qualifying, I lost to Edward, and who was 16 years old. And then the week after that, um, I won the last round of qualifying against uh, Bobo Zivinovic, who ended up winning Wimbledon. <laughs> no, I, um, I remember watching him play the Orange Bowl. Yeah. So it was, and and all I'm thinking when I came back. You know, the coach is saying, what are you talking about losing to 15, 16 year olds? I'm like, Bill, these guys get, are going to be really good. Uh, well, they, the, but, yeah, Becker and Edberg, three years in a row, they shared the Wimbledon title. Yeah. Um, yeah. How about Vlander? Um, boy, that's just going into a water torture chamber um, playing him because there was that sense of that cumulative pressure that I talked about, not because someone was pressuring you, but because there was no ball he couldn't get to and he was never going to miss. So the pressure always felt like I've got to do a little something more. Um, and as soon as you start doing that, as soon as you start trying to do things that you're, that you're not capable of doing in a consistent manner, you know, that's, that's a loss waiting to happen. But there was this cumulative pressure just based on the fact that you didn't feel like there was any ball you could hit that, that could put a dent in the guy. Yeah. v uh, was so complete. Um, you know, he, I think it was 82 where he won the French by 88. He, yeah. he never won Wimbledon, but he did win the Australian right. on grass and that in 88, he won yeah. three, three, three of the majors. How about Yannick right. Noah? Right. What a great serve. What about Noah? What comes to your mind? Oh, what an athlete. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, always had a little bit of an artistic flair, but uh, probably one of the best athletes I ever played against on the tour. Um, I had a match with him to make the quarters of the Australian Open, and I had won the first two sets, had break points all over the place in the third set, lost in a tiebreaker break points all over the place in the four set lost in a tiebreaker and then ended up losing nine seven in the fifth um on his first break point of the match um so it was probably the best match i ever played on tour um and lost nine seven in the fifth wow um I yeah, remember he was but, a, he was a human pogo stick there was a there was a film of him oh. uh gilde kermadec a French photographer, uh, he's just yeah. up at the net, jumping over it like it was a popsicle stick, and for going on yeah. for a minute after a minute, just jumping over the net. 
one of those things. Don't try this at home. Yeah. Well, in, you know, amongst the world-class athletes that were, that were playing tennis back in the day, he really stood out in terms of athleticism. He, he was, what a, what an athlete. What an amazing service motion. Um, you know, we spent yeah. so much time talking about Vic Braden and how he studied the science of tennis. And people, you know, people go, "Did uh, did Braden coach Noah?" And, and, and no, he did not. But you know, people sometimes just one way or the other, they end up being so efficient, despite you know their background, who coached them, who didn't coach them. Let me ask you this about right. his history. Um, you know, I spent so much time. You know, I was born into an ice hockey family and played for 15 years. I really think that in hockey, the young players listen and they. They respect the players of years gone by, but I don't think that's really the case in tennis. I mean, I think that young kids, uh, so, you know, with YouTube, it's like, you know, go watch Edberg. It's like, if they, or, they, or if they were to listen to Federer and they said, well, with, why don't you, someone said to him, why don't you come to the net, when Edberg was coaching him, why don't you come to the net more? Um, like, like Stefan did, he goes, you're coming in more, but why don't you come even more? And he goes, well, if I volleyed like Edberg, I would. He said, I don't, vol- I don't volley as well. But why, why do you, I mean, do you agree with that, that tennis players don't really have an appreciation for the history of players that, from yesteryear? And if so, why, why not? Um, I've got a couple thoughts. I think back uh, in my era, um, there weren't that many ex-players who were at the top of the game who then were coaches. Um, so I think there was a little bit of a lack of exposure to it. Um, I also think that, um, (laughs) uh, you know, the game was changing so quickly that they would look back at, um, you know, the former greats and, and think, well, the game's completely different now, you know, as a transition to more of a baseline game. But, I think in today's world, Steve, I think that's changed. Um, I think, you know, the, the Federer, Nadal, Djokovic, Murray, um, rivalry and, but also friendship and respect for each other has, has changed some of that. I think, you know, the kids growing up now may have a, and I don't know this, but I, I, um, uh, there's some conjecture that that may be different in today's world because of those four guys. You know, getting into tennis, I was told by older, older brothers, try to hang out with people who forgot more than, you know, I watched Jared Lightis take lessons from three people, Warren Woodcock, Fred Stolle, and Ian Crookenden. Mm-hmm. I took the role of starving artist where I worked at night. So I could do anything and everything in, in tennis during the day. I think a lot of young people that, would like to learn a lot about tennis teaching. They'd be better off not to teach tennis and, okay, get a job waiting on tables and then hang out during the day and observe. But I remember uh, Crookenden added a a slight, you know, a little larger backswing with Garolitis on the serve, and he made it his ritual. And he played that famous semifinal against um, Borg at Wimbledon. He was doing, he just was, he just did what he was told in the lesson. And, doesn't matter what you say is that if a young kid gets to work with someone played on the tour, I mean, they're just going to have that much. They're going to have so much respect for someone who's been there. I think that's yeah, what you said, yeah. a big factor. Yeah. I think a lot of it is, you know, are the, are the greats of the game can get out there and coach, um, you know, and, and, and share, share that knowledge. Right. You know, let me ask you this, but you, you had to retire 29, if you could talk about the injuries, but I'm sure that was uh, very difficult. You would want to stay out there longer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can talk about that a little bit. Abs- yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the last year and a half, two years of my career was sort of one injury, not one injury, but a couple injuries uh, after the next. I had stress fractures in, in both tibias, uh, forced me to sit out for a while, uh, probably four or five months and then got back out on tour and about five or six months, uh, back on tour. And I developed a stress fracture in, in one of my lumbar vertebrae. And, uh, I was never one that could practice 
just a moderate amount and show up and be ready to play against the best players in the world. I, I had to work harder than everyone else. Um, in, in part, uh, because I never felt like I was as physically gifted as the top players. Um, so I had to ask myself is, you know, is that approach to the game taking its toll now that I've got a stress fracture in a, um, for the second time in a year and a half, um, I had been admitted to business school and, um, uh, you know, I, I, for better or worse, there was a financial equation attached to it where I had a disability policy that if I retired because of uh, the stress fracture, I would get paid out on that. And then lastly, uh, an old friend of mine that was the director of tennis at Longwood Cricket Club in Boston, um, you know, one of the founding members of the, of the USTA, uh, was leaving the, the head position and I thought, you know, if, if I could get that job, go to business school and have the disability policy pay out, uh, this might uh, make the most sense in terms of uh, ending my career, given that I, you know, was laid up for at least another six months with the stress fracture in my lower back. So uh, as it turns out, that was a, a rational jumping off for me. Are you there? I think I might have lost you. Are you still there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought I lost you for a minute. Yeah. Tell us about Longwood, yeah. famous historical cl club. They used to have the, the pro event. Um, what was it like to work at Longwood? Oh, a smile on my face every day that I walked in. Uh, you know, the 24 grass courts, another 18 clay courts, and uh, one of these places where... When you walk in, on some level, you can hear the greats of the game whispering. Uh, you know, some of the greatest players in the history of the game have not only won the tournament that they put on for years and years, but um, graced the courts, uh, you know, from Tilden to Laver to Rosewall to, um, you know, Connors, McEnroe, just on and on. Um, you know, played at that club. And, and um, uh, also the fact that it's a tennis club. It's not a, it's not a tennis program inside of a golf club. <laughs> right. um, tennis, tennis was king. And, and that was an absolute joy to be able to run the tennis operation where tennis was the one and only priority. Uh, so again, Incredibly lucky, incredibly lucky yeah. to find myself in that position. Longwood was the tune-up to Forest Hills, and Forest Hills, uh, it was on grass, but it was for three years, it was on American <coughs> Hard True, I think, what, 75, mm -hmm. 76, 77, before it went out to Flushing Meadows in 78. So yep. what, what was it like to be around the pro event? Uh, at that time, you, well, knew, I had, you knew everybody was playing, right? Yeah, pretty much. I, I mean, I had played in it a number of years. Um, and when I retired, um, I was sort of an unofficial host, <laughs> you know, for, for all of these guys that had been playing with and against, uh, for a number of years. And needless to say, it was, geez, I'd, I'd sort of rather be out there playing than, than hosting. But, um, again, it was, it was an honor to be the director of tennis there. And it was an honor to, uh, sort of, be the unofficial host of these guys coming back. Um, but not, not without a tinge of jealousy, wishing I was out there. Well, but you had to wear so many hats when you were the tennis director, you know, that many courts, how many pros did you have? How many teaching pros were on your staff? You know, we, we probably had seven, eight, nine pros, depending on, depending on the year. So we had a, uh, you know, when I came in, we built up the junior program uh, quite a bit. Uh, we did things like brought in new, you know, video equipment and, and things that this club had never contemplated before. So, we, um, you know, it, it's interesting, Steve, and, and I'm sure you can appreciate this. When I first started teaching, I loved the teaching. 
And then um, I was on the court so much, I was starting to feel like, well, it's a little bit too much. And I transitioned to, you know, managing the, the pros to the degree that I wasn't on the court at all. <laughs> and now I missed the teaching again. Mm. Um, so, so there was a real evolution to my career there um, that uh, included, you know, a lot of management of programs and tournaments and, you know, everything that goes on at a tennis club like that. And, and during that time, but you also uh, went back to pro tennis coaching, Lendl, I even my notes here, Lendl, Greg Rosetsky, Pam Shriver. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, lucky to have known uh, Yvonne and practiced with him a bit when I was on the tour. And he asked me to come back and and, um, and work with him a bit, particularly in getting ready for Wimbledon. Um, and again, just to be exposed to a guy like that, how hard he works, how focused, how disciplined how organized um, was just an incredible uh, experience and, and lesson. Um, Greg Rizedski, uh was an interesting experience because he was young and he was, it was fairly immature at the time and, um, you know, helped him uh, quite a bit and traveled with him a little bit uh, up into the, you know, until he got to about top 100 in the world. And then, you know, I was starting to have a family and it just wasn't going to work traveling. And um, Pam Shriver, um, I worked with her for a year immediately after I retired. Uh, and that was a great experience. She, she, I worked with her for a year. By the end of the year, she had gotten back into the top 10 and and made the finals of their year end event, which at the time was the Virginia Slims in Madison Square Garden. Um, so that, that was a good run. But again, you know, I had done all the traveling and while I loved the coaching, I was starting to sort of settle in to a different life in Boston. And being a full time coach on the road just wasn't, wasn't that, uh, what really wasn't going to work for me. But then also, um, being in Boston, uh, you're for, I think five, five years or more, you coached the Boston lobsters. So that kept you connected to pro tennis. Could you talk a little bit about coaching the lobsters team, world team tennis? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, kudos to Billy Jean for, for keeping the world team tennis franchise alive because I just, I l absolutely love the format. I love the men and women on the same team. I love the men and women playing with and against each other. It, it was an absolutely wonderful experience. Um, and I was lucky enough to be able to coach the Boston franchise for five years and uh, at a point when I really had not been involved with pro tennis. So it was also wonderful to be able to uh, sort of reconnect with, with this uh with the pro tennis world that I had really been separated from for, for probably, you know, 15 years at that point. Uh, and just, again, to be able to coach all levels, uh, it was, it was a lot of fun to coach, you know, these pros, some of the best tennis players in the world. And we had people on our team, John Isner played for us from time to time. Martina Navratilova played, um, for us for a number of matches and and uh, played against you know Johnny Johnny Mac was still playing a little bit in world team tennis and we played against Venus and Serena when they would come and play for uh, the Washington franchise so just to have that exposure again was was really exciting and, and wonderful I'd have to ask you about uh, a match with Ma against Mac and Roe um, Leander Pays, I followed his tennis from a distance. A couple of my students, uh, John Lofty Diaga, Raven Klassen, played with him. But one of our students had the chance to be part of the, the BAT program, the Britannica Armitage program, when, uh -huh. when he was a kid, Simon Rogers. So I've always liked to watch Leander Pays play and like to think that Simon had some input in on his tennis game. But tell us a little bit about McEnroe and Pays. You were, you were there as a coach. Uh, did you have to, didn't you have yeah. to, didn't you have to, uh, Kind of tell Johnny Mac that you're going to grab him by the shirt collar. How'd that go? <laughs> we, 
we we were playing them in a doubles match, and as as John was wont to do, he he turned the whole thing into a zoo, and um, you know he was he was for whatever he, he you know whether it was a line call or this that or the other thing, but uh, we we had a we had a few words, but it wasn't it wasn't a place to really go toe to toe because. I wasn't on the court, so there was nothing really that I could do other than be supportive of my players and tell him in so many words that, you know, he's out of line and get the hell out of here. Yeah. <laughs> so, he, you know, he, he's an interesting cat because um, he's obviously a very bright guy, but he uses this sort of uh, sense of intimidation to, in a lot of ways, uh, assess people. Um, are they going to stand up to me? Uh, and if they stand up to me, okay, now, now I'll engage with them. Or are they just, you know, going to shy away when I sort of create this, this aura of intimidation and then he really doesn't want anything to do with them. <laughs> so he's an interesting cat. With, um, also in Boston, uh, I had the chance to work with Dave Fish in the Harvard tennis camp, training the tennis yeah. staff, and then be there for a long weekend. And at the, the last day of the training, the, the kids from Tenacity would come out. I know you're a co-founder. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about Tenacity. That's something that you've done in Boston. So when I when I was at the Longwood Cricket Club, an uh, old friend uh, who I used to practice with on tour a little bit, also a Boston guy uh, by the name of Ned Eames, came back and uh to boston and decided that uh rather than being a a consultant he was in you know the world where he's consulting with fortune 500 companies he wanted to start a uh an urban tennis program uh that used tennis as a hook to get kids to buy into both literacy but also life skills um so I was lucky enough to, to connect with him and help him get it off the ground. Um, between the two of us, we founded it. It evolved into serving over 5,000 kids a summer on the public courts, um, along with another 1,000 kids in the Boston Public Schools, um, where we'll bring these kids along, not only and again, using tennis as a hook, uh, will bring these kids along to give them all the support and the resources to be successful in school and go on and, and be productive members of society. So, uh, Steve, you know as well as I do, everything that we've gotten from tennis, there's there's a uh, obligation to, to to give back as a function of it, and um, that was a. It was a wonderful ride. It's an incredible program, still in existence today, and um, you know, it has helped thousands of kids over the years get through high school and, and go on and have successful lives. Could you touch a little bit about on fundraising? I know uh, Tenacity has been very <laughs> successful with, with fundraising. Yeah, um, it's it's a hard model. You wake up every year and think, okay, where are we going to get five million dollars to to run the program this year? Um, but you know, one of the one of the things that I did, I had this crazy, uh, you know, sort of romantic vision from back in college and doing some hiking in the main woods back in college that I wanted to hike the Appalachian Trail. So we created a uh, sort of a virtual experience for some of the kids to come along with me as I through hiked the Appalachian Trail back in 2014 um, with donations committed to me completing the, the 2,200 miles of, of the Appalachian Trail. We ended up raising uh, somewhere a little north of $400,000 uh, wow. through that program and you know, sort of took these kids and exposed them to a world that they're completely unaware of living in urban Boston. Um, But it's a a hard, it's a hard model, Steve. It's a really hard model. I mean, because you have to do it every year, right? You have to raise the money every year. Yeah. Right. Every, every year you wake up and you've got exposure to some of the money, but 
like, okay, where are we going to get that that delta of three million dollars or two million dollars or whatever it is this year to, to run our program again? Um, it's a it's a never ending stress for organizations like that. A uh, friend of mine I grew up with uh, here from all the time. I've known him over fifty years now. I guess no, actually close to sixty. I grew up with his son went covered the Appalachian Trail. Where did you start? Where'd you finish? How long did it take you? So you, I started south, Springer Mountain, uh, Georgia. Uh, you finish at Mount Katahdin in Maine, and it's 2,185 miles um, on the trail. You probably cover another couple hundred miles off the trail going off and resupplying and, or you know, getting a good night's sleep somewhere. Um, but it took me uh, three and a half months, which is pretty quick. I was... I was lucky to have the luxury of time, but not unlimited time. So, um, you know, three and a half months is, is a pretty quick, uh, trek for that. Uh, but it was, uh, it was quite an experience and to, to hike through the mountains in the South is, is, is really eye opening for a kid that grew up in, in, in New England, the Northeast and, sort of a Northeast perspective on, on everything from religion to politics to everyday life to be exposed to that was, was really quite an experience. Wow. Um, let me read this cause we're talking about tenacity and you being a giver, not a taker, uh, doing my homework. Uh, the, a Dean from Bates, um, about you. I am not surprised to learn about Bud Show's journey about others and their welfare. Such personal strength was evident in everything he did as an undergraduate. His fierce sense of integrity was always joined by a gentle and giving spirit. His obviously competitive successes in tennis were always held in check by a deeper appreciation of what binds us all together. I continue to remember him celebrating many goodnesses of life. Carl Straub. With that, tell us a little about you're playing a match, you lose, and then you end up water skiing like the same day. <laughs> so, uh, uh, one of my closest friends in the world, a guy by the name of Rob Kramer, uh, and I played basketball together at Bates, and he was working on Wall He was from New York City, but he also was working on Wall Street and um, had an apartment in the city. So, whenever I would go play the U.S. Open or anything in or around you know New York City, I would just go and stay with him at his apartment. So, uh, one year I'm playing McEnroe on the middle, uh, Sunday of the open. So third round and I leave the apartment early in the morning, go out, warm up, play the match. I lose three tight sets, uh, and I'm coming off the court and my buddy Rob Kramer standing there along with my family and a whole host of other friends. And he says, if you hurry, we can make the next shuttle back to Boston. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he goes, well, uh, you know, our uh, mutual college friend, Kim Dobel, is having a party down in Duxbury, you know, which is a town on the south shore of Boston, right on the water, beautiful, beautiful you know, place. I'm like, Rob, what are you talking about? He goes, well, if you really hurry, we can make the shuttle and be at that party in, in about an hour and a half. And I'm like, well, but Rob, all my stuff is back in your apartment. And he looks down at his feet, and there are my bags, packed, ready to go. <laughs> so um, I'm sure he would have hid them if I had beaten McEnroe, but I didn't. So I ran up to the locker room, grabbed my stuff. We hopped on the shuttle, and we made it to Duxbury in under two hours from walking off of center court at the U.S. Open, and, and within a matter of moments after that, I was water skiing off of Duxbury Beach. And I, you know, I laughed because they saw the reality of my situation in beating back and row, and uh, we're going to take every opportunity to, to uh, have some fun with it as well. But, you know, to have shared that day with all of my college buddies that were at this party on the South shore of Boston was, uh, one of my fondest memories of, uh, playing on the tour, <laughs> despite it not being at the tournament. <laughs> uh, that's a great story. Um, 
Another chapter I have here that you uh, married a, a tennis player. Mm -hmm. Lane who played at Boston College. It reminds me of another Arthur Ashe thought was uh, never teach your spouse to play tennis. <laughs> Uh, but you and your wife are owners and operators of a tennis club since 1991, Gohasset Tennis Club. Talk mm -hmm. to us a little bit about, you know, what you're doing with your tennis club. Yeah. Well, it, you know, it uh, is a wonderful community resource in the sense that uh, this club has been there since the 60s at some point. And we were lucky enough to have the opportunity to buy it and run it. Um, and again, give back to the community. And we, we were lucky when we bought it that um, because of our background, because of our experience in teaching and my experience, you know, managing clubs, um, we were able to bring some real added value when, when we bought it. And uh, we've been incredibly lucky to have this thriving indoor tennis club and it's indoor tennis and that's it there's no fitness there's no pool there's no uh anything else with it it's just tennis um so it's sort of unique in today's world um but again it's a wonderful community resource and you know steve one of the things that uh, i know you're familiar with but that has always struck me through my life in the game of tennis is Everywhere I go, there's this wonderful community that I seem to be finding myself in the middle of because of tennis and, um, you know, the friendships and sort of a common sensibility around the game of tennis has, has been a real luxury in my life. And this is just one more chapter in that to, to be owner and manager of an indoor tennis club like that. And with you and Elaine, talk a little bit about your kids. I, I just, I just know Christo, um, and obviously a very good tennis player, played at Harvard, and now he's coaching yep. at Brandeis. Um, all three yep. all three kids tennis players, or like yourself, did they play other sports? You no, know, they, they, you know, the other two sort of systematically rejected it. You know, not a typical, oh, you're doing it? I'm not going to do that. But uh, Christo, Christo got the bug and uh, was, you know, uh, a good junior and, and – had great experiences with his tennis and, and Harvard. Um, my, our second uh, child, Luke, uh, in college, he was sort of the outside the box thinker. I saw the world, you know, a little bit differently than everyone else. And he became a springboard diver. Um, and, you know, was one of the, one of the top divers in the state. And, um, when he got to college, he decided he didn't want to live the rest of his life in a pool, <laughs> which actually made a lot of sense to me at the time. Um, and then, uh, so he went on to have a wonderful college experience, but not with the springboard diving. Then our youngest, Haley, uh, played lacrosse and soccer, um, went to Middlebury College, another small uh, liberal arts college in New England, up in Middlebury, Vermont. And, she played lacrosse and ended up winning a national championship with the uh, on the uh, Middlebury women's lacrosse team. Um, so she had a wonderful athletic experience that was all her own as well. So all three kids sort of chose what fit their interest, what fit their mind's eye, and, and had great experiences. And so, now my daughter says it's time for her to become the tennis prodigy she never was. <laughs> with um, Harvard and Middlebury, where did the diver go to school? Uh, he went to Ithaca College up okay. in uh, yeah. Ithaca, New York. Yeah, yeah. Up, yeah, upstate New York, high above Cayuga Waters, Cayuga Lake. Beautiful place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Middlebury, I mean, I played hockey against Middlebury when I was a kid. Uh, back in the day, um, all schools had two teams because freshmen could not play varsity. I know right. one of my sisters applied there and was accepted. I, I played hockey with a guy where the the coach uh, saw his resume or his application, and you know he he really got the gears from him was because uh, the hockey coach sent the check back because that's that's such a tough school to get into. But I mean, yeah. Yeah. I've I've been in Switzerland now, but when I first went to Middlebury, I, I thought looking out the window, I thought I was in Switzerland. It's an unbelievable place. Yeah. They they actually. They, <laughs> I'm sorry. They've won. They maybe, maybe it's even more now. But at one point, they'd won national championships in six different sports. Yeah, 
Yeah, they they uh, there's a there's a trophy for the Division three school that has the overall best results uh, athletically in the country. Um, and I, I want to say it's the Athletic Directors Cup or, or something like that. And Middlebury is is annually uh, in you know the top three or four schools in the country. You know, you're you're in the middle of nowhere, Vermont. It's it's wonderfully idyllic, but it's it's also a place where you need other activities to stay busy. And athletics is is one of those, and it's really important to the school and, and sort of the community within the school. Uh, yeah, it's a wonderful, wonderful place. I believe Dave Schwartz is from Ithaca. He played at Cornell, but he was the coach yeah. at Middlebury, yeah. and, and he won a national yeah. championship. Uh, yeah. And he's gone on yeah. to win at, at another school. And I think also, too, he's maybe one of the only guys who, or one of the only coaches who's won national championships in two different sports. I think, you know, Brian Shelton, he'd come to mind. He won at Georgia Tech, yeah. and then he won at Florida. Yeah. Um, with, um, I have this in my notes. Tell us a little bit about uh, platform tennis in New England, the revenge of the 3.5 tennis player. Then we'll talk a little bit about, <laughs> a little bit about pickleball. Tell us about plat- <laughs> platform tennis. I know that's big in New England, right? Oh, it's, it, it, in, I would say the last 20 years, it's just absolutely exploded. So it's a platform up above the ground. Uh, with about 15 foot high fence that goes around the entire thing and it looks like a mini tennis court uh, and you play the ball off the fence uh, you play it similarly to tennis uh, scoring similar and uh, but it's more of a defensive oriented game uh, it's still because of the ball uh, and because of the paddle, it's very difficult to be offensive and because of the way it comes off the screen. So it's more of a defensive oriented sport and it's played during the winter. Uh, a lot of people see it as a, as a good sort of alternative to hanging out with their buddies and having a couple beers, uh, that golf is, you know, during the summer. So it's a sort of a, uh, wonderful sport. Um, especially yeah. to put a paddle and a ball in play during the winter. And tell us about your friend who calls it the revenge of the 3.5 tennis player. So, he, he was, he was on a, a you know, a Eastern European country Davis cup team. So he was really good, but he wasn't, um, you know, he wasn't like a top 200 in the world player. So, I, but anyways, he's really good. And he started to play this game and because it's so defensive oriented and there's so little swing to striking the ball, he found he was playing against these guys that were three, five tennis players and he couldn't beat them because they would just lob it, dink it, lob it, dink it. And they didn't have to take a full swing. So they were really capable of doing it. Um, and it's a smaller space. So your movement, um, uh, greater athleticism and movement doesn't create the advantage that it does in tennis. And he, and he turned to me one day and he goes, you know, this, this so-and-so sport is the revenge of the three fives. <laughs> you know, they now could compete against, you know, someone that was virtually a, a world-class tennis player. And, uh, and then you take it, you take, you take it a step further and said the pickleball is the revenge of the 2.0. Is that right? Or is that? It, abso- it absolutely is. And I, I you know, I, from that standpoint, I think it's it's brilliant, and it's such a wonderful addition to the racket sports world because you know people that are older take a couple steps in any direction. There's no real swing; people can just block the ball back. It opens it up to so many more people, Steve. Yeah, no, you're, uh, you're being nice now. In a previous conversation, you said it's a one-step sport, and, and it, it, is, and it, it really is. is. It's amazing. It, it is. It's a one-step sport. So, so think about how many more people can play that than have to cover an entire tennis court. Um, you know, but I jokingly tell my wife that uh, a it's a fixed income sport, so I'm not ready to do it yet. And when I'm 80, maybe I'll think about playing. <laughs> I, I do think in tennis, what we need to do is if you can't beat them, join them, and I think we need to teach tennis skills, have people play pickleball, and then people play tennis. Yep. 
Um, Absolutely. In, in watching pickleball, I walk by it every day at this beautiful park, and it reminds me of the 70s because you could just tell the tennis, the pickleball teachers, not the tennis, the pickleball teachers, a lot of them have converted from tennis, but they're yeah. gonna, it looks like they're just making it up as they go along because it's, yeah. it's such a new sport. I mean, it's been around for a while, but it's right. just exploded. Right. Amazing how how it's exploded you know a mutual friend of ours eric buderak at one point uh, i guess a year or two ago was uh looking to build an indoor pickle facility i said well that's sort of interesting eric he goes but my ultimate goal is to use it to bring little kids in so that they have a rackets foundation to then get them into tennis no, that's very smart. And, that's smart. And I, I thought not only was it smart, but it also, you know, fits my whole sensibility and, and model of teaching, which is start volleying and move your way back. Um, so okay. anyway, so it's, it should be used as a tool. It should be used as a tool to develop tennis players. Absolutely. What we're doing with our great base curriculum, it's, you know, before the age of 26, I was trained to teach tennis by Vic Braid and Dennis Vandermeer and Welby Van Horn. And um, I'm always telling people, you got to play other sports, play other sports, and come out with tennis. And don't think that at a really early age that you're going to get your athletic training from tennis because it's so technical. You know, we certainly right. take our time right. with static balance training. and um, But, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's not the fun factor that other sports have. I mean, certainly basketball, soccer, two sports that you've played. Um, to be really, really good, you got to dedicate a boatload of time. But kids can kick mm -hmm. a soccer ball back and forth and pass a basketball back and forth, but kids can't necessarily rally a tennis ball back and forth. Right, right. Um, I have in my notes, uh, I don't know if you ever have a senior moment, but I certainly have quite a few of them. And it's great to, it's, it's great to tell you we're producing this podcast in the middle of the day. Sometimes we're making these at midnight, but um, tell me about the theme or the saying from the Milrose games that jog your memory from a previous conversation. <laughs> so, you know, what, what does it, what does it take to go from a division three, you know, multi-sport athlete to, you know, top 40 in the world in tennis. And um, quite honestly, along the way, it takes a lot of ignorance um, in, in a good way, ignorance. Um, and I've, I've used this quote by this guy, and I, can't, I can never remember his name, but he was the athlete of the decade for the Milrose Games. And the Milrose Games is an indoor track meet that, um, back in the 60s and 70s and 80s was, you know, the premier indoor track and field event in the world. And this guy was voted the athlete of the decade for the 60s. And as part of his acceptance speech for this award, he talked about, you know, his quote was, my greatest advantage relative to all of my competitors is that I was never smart enough to know that I couldn't do it. Um, and that speaks to the ignorance that I was, that I was talking about in that if you focus on the end goal, <laughs> um, you're never going to, it seems so grand and so far away. It detracts from you doing all the things that you need to do every day to eventually get to that goal. Um, and the, the big, one of the talents to getting up every day and trying to figure out how to be a little bit better is to be ignorant to the fact that, you know, there are a lot of people out there that say, I can't do that, but I'm not one of them. Um, just be ignorant to the fact that you can't do it. Um, and, at some point you may look up and, and, and in fact, you could do it. And, um, you've sort of reached a, a level within the game that, uh, most everyone thought was, was not a possibility. No, so, it's very powerful. The technology uh, today with, I mean, it was USTA rankings and tennis recruiting. It was, you go to a tournament and the kids say, Oh, I'm, I'm playing a four star, you know, like the match is over yeah. I play a four star. And now, right, now it's right. a UTR. I think it's really unfortunate that kid could be in the fifth, sixth grade and they know their match is going to be on 
some computer printout or at, at someone yeah. at, at, a, at a laptop, someone's fingertips. Um, and so just play for fun. And it's like, you know, it's, it, it, I think it's in some ways, tennis is too structured now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know what, Steve, there are a lot of, there are a lot of losses and defeats along the way. And, um, you know, you have to be ignorant to that sort of, oh, geez, I lost. No. Well, what'd you learn? And how are you going to use that the next day to get a little bit better? And uh, uh, that's all big part of it. Well, part you, of you it. certainly as a kid learned from the get-go as far as being a, a, on a team, being a teammate. You know, we always say, okay, the soccer team, they, they lose and then misery enjoys company. They, they go to Pizza Hut. They're 10 years old, 9 years old, and they're with their buddies. But a lot of times when a kid loses, they get in the backseat of the minivan and mom or dad, um, sometimes they just can't help themselves and they, they start coaching the kid. Uh, it's, it's in, that, in that sense, it becomes a knockout sport and a lot of kids, uh, yeah. they leave the sport. Yeah. Let me ask you a little bit about golf. You're telling me you're playing golf now. I consider that a four letter sport, a four letter word. <laughs> uh, my, I had every opportunity. I, I didn't really grow up a uh, silver spoon, but my parents always belonged to a, a golf club, country club. And my father yeah. kept saying, you got to start now. You're going to regret it when you're older. But I, I just never connected with, yeah. with golf. And the thing also too, is that I spent a lot of time in sunshine state. And when you're teaching tennis, one of the last things you want to do is go out and be in the sun Right. But, and my right. Grand, my grandfather used to call it cow pasture pool, but tell us about your golf. You're, you're into it at a pretty competitive level now, correct? Yeah. Well, around 12 years ago, a buddy of mine who built and owns a, a golf club in the area said, come on, you're playing with us. And it was with these two other guys who were also buddies of mine. And I'm like, you know, I don't play golf. Um, I always thought it took way too much time. And after a few holes, I'd start thinking about, other places I want to be, other places I should be. And, um, but my kids had, were on the, our, our youngest, Haley, was on the verge of going off to college. And um, I went and played with these guys and realized that even though I didn't play golf because of the scoring system, I could be competitive with them because um, of the handicap system. Um, so anyways, it, it – also became something very quickly that, wow, I'm getting better at something. Because <laughs> I certainly wasn't getting better at tennis. And there were very few things at the age of 50 that I was getting better at. And that was exciting. So I, I sort of, through all of the, the training and focus and getting better every day, concepts that I, that I had learned through tennis and through it at the golf, um, and started to get better pretty quickly. There are a lot of similarities in terms of swing plane and and um, impact angles and creating spin and so on and so forth that were intuitive. So I got pretty good uh, fairly quickly. And then, again, to, to satisfy my competitive needs, I started playing um, some state tournaments and uh, a few years ago, was lucky enough to get into a, a U.S. GA championship, which was sort of the bucket list item, you know, to getting better at golf. Um, but it's provided me an opportunity to compete, and it's provided me an opportunity to again, you know, have something physical, athletic to to try to work at and get better at, and that's always been something that. It's a smile on my face, Steve. With, with, uh, but with the Boston winners, uh, you, hit, you hit golf balls during the winter? Uh, I do because I get, I'll get south to visit some friends here and there. Um, there's a local club that has uh, heated hitting bays. And then my wife and I will get away. Um, we've been going to Hawaii for a couple months each winter for the last uh, seven or eight winters. So... I we'll get to play a fair amount and just hit balls and practice when, when we're there. What, what island do you go to? Uh, Kauai this year. Normally we'll go to the big island, <clears throat> um, but this year we're going to Kauai. My son Connor played Hawaii. I've only been there once. I've been in a tournament. 
It was interesting with the USDA. Every every coach with the USDA made that Hawaii tournament. Uh, it's a nice place to visit. Yeah. And yeah. But yeah. Uh, yes, Steve Campbell was uh, on Maui, the tennis director at Kapalua. I mean, uh, what a. Yeah. I mean, I've all you know. Back in the day, I used to do a lot of distance running. I could tell all sorts of stories about this golf course and that golf course. But what a beautiful place! So I have to ask you the question: What's your handicap? Uh, I'm a right now. I'm like a point seven or something like that. So not not quite scratch, not quite zero, but uh, within reach. Within and reach. so, like year year number one when you started. Uh, I mean, where were you? Uh, every, every, and everything. There's a beginning. What was your high yeah. handicap? So I, your highest. You know, I started. Yeah, I started out at about a fourteen, and then after a year, I was down to about a seven. After two years, I was down to you know in the three area. But the 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 way the handicap system works is it's almost an exponential equation that defines your your handicap as you get better and better so to move from you know a seven to a three is a quantum leap relative going from 14 to seven and from three to one or three to zero is is even that much more of a leap so um but it uh it's it's you know again i go back to i love to compete I love to work at something where I feel like I'm getting better at it. And uh, this has fulfilled that for me. Oh, that's great. Welby Van Horn, he became the best golfer, best amateur in Puerto Rico. His system, uh, Philip Eisenberg, who owned his camp, the slogan, yeah. the slogan was, learn tennis you'll never forget. And Welby's 3-8 yeah. well, system of balance, you know, static balance, you finish, your back, yeah. back heels up. I mean, it's the kinetic chain. The 3-H is your heel, your hips, your head. Um, yeah. and that, that's one thing that's gone away from tennis teaching, but, you know, people who know Welby system, uh, can progress in golf very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And balance. I got to ask you this yeah. question. I just have a few more. Um, I think this is a scene for a movie. Uh, I just love this story. So you got to know Linda well, and yeah. uh, tell us the ball hockey story. That's an amazing story. So, so, um, at Lendl's house in Connecticut and I'm um, training with him and he would have different pros come in and practice and whatnot um, at various times. And um, I'm there and, and he gets a phone call and it's Stefan Edberg. So at this point, Lendl's one in the world, Edberg's three in the world and, and me. <laughs> and, uh, uh, he says, hey, I'm coming over to the States. Any chance I could come and practice with you guys for a few days? So Linda goes, yeah, great. So I'm a kid in a candy store, right? I'm practicing with the number one and number three players in the world. And one of the things that Lendl was famous for is we'd go and we'd practice from 10 to 12. And we'd hit the first ball as the second hand hit 10 o'clock. And we'd stop practicing at the strike of 12 and then we'd go back and practice from two to four and we'd start at a second two o'clock uh and, 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 to interrupt and this we, is a court in his backyard no this no. is at a at an indoor club oh, okay. okay that he owned okay. in greenwich and so it was you know late fall early winter kind of kind of um time of year and uh out of the blue, we're practicing one afternoon and it's like two fifteen. He goes, Come on, we gotta go. And Edberg and I looked at each other like, What? He never ever does this. He goes, Come on, come on, let's go, let's go. So he he loved to drive fast. So we get in his car. He must have drove ninety miles an hour down these, you know, wooded back roads in Greenwich. And we pull up to his house and there are all of these cars out uh, side of his house, you know, Mercedes and Range Rovers and Porsches and like, geez, what's going on? All of a sudden, you know, what's going on here? The gate to his property opens up, we pull through and there are all these bicycles, like kids' bikes uh, in his driveway. And we're like, what the heck is going on? So we get out, he goes, come on, come on, come on. He, he, we go down into his basement, he throws his hockey gloves and hockey sticks 
and he's putting on goalie equipment. We're like, hey, Lendo, what the hell is going on here? He goes, just come on, come on, come on, come on. We come out of his basement. We go across his yard to where the tennis court was, and the net's down, the posts are out, and there are these guys and kids playing street hockey. And he goes, come on, let's go play. So we go over there, we start, we jump in, and now we're playing with these guys. And I look up and I'm like, geez, I know this guy. And I was like, holy mackerel, he's a New York Ranger. And then, to make a long story short, I'm talking to the to one of the kids that was playing, and he was just a neighborhood kid, and all the guys were New York Rangers. And all the kids were just the neighborhood kids. And I'm saying, this is unbelievable. This is unbelievable. And then Lendl and Edberg and myself and the kid goes, oh, we do this all the time. <laughs> and we must have played street hockey for, you know, another two and a half hours and just absolute joy having, uh, you know, these these professional hockey players playing with the neighborhood kids playing with a, with a couple pretty good tennis players. It was, it was one of the most fun afternoons I've ever had. No, uh, uh, you know, um, we call it street hockey, but ball hockey, there's a clip on mm -hmm. YouTube of Federer with like two seconds left on the clock. He's playing, it's in Toronto during the Canadian open. He's playing with a lot of guys that are yeah. on the Leafs and Federer sure enough, yeah. uh, he, he takes the last shot and scores. Um, but no, yeah. that's, that's a great, great story. Um, it was just, and, but you know what, it, you know what, Steve, it speaks to, um, you know, one of the reasons Lendl was so successful and that was he really, and it, and it was counter to his public personality. He knew how to have fun. He knew how to have fun practicing. He knew how to make it fun to, to train. And it was all about competing and having fun fun competing and that that was sort of the epitome example of it of it all but uh no one of the yeah great back in the day people didn't think he had a sense of humor but i i observed practices with judy murray's there and lendl's chirping uh are you here again oh. don't you have a house <laughs> right. don't you have a house to go to? <laughs> right oh it's non-stop yeah with yeah. uh no and also to his organization you know his, his structure i mean that's how he mm -hmm. became so good i mean right it, Right. Everything was planned out. Everything was very calculated. Yeah, he was an amazing guy. He really is. I've been in a couple of meetings where you know he was working with the USTA and and you know, he was very grounded. Well, no, no technique. I, I don't do technique. And but he, you know, he would have everybody. Everybody was certainly listening. I mean, a guy gets a eight U.S. Open finals. Wow, what a what right. a what a what an amazing player. Uh, here's a yeah. question that everybody's asked. Um, you know, tennis, certainly, I think there's some issues with the growth and welfare of tennis. If you're a commissioner of the day, I mean, your lifetime in tennis now, and you've been in so many different, oh, so many different chapters, so many different roles. Uh, what comes to your mind? Uh, what could we do to make tennis better? Um, I, you know, one of the things I was listening to a podcast the other day, and I had forgotten about this, um, and it was Eric again. A mutual friend of ours, Eric Buderak, uh, talking about the the four game quick set. Um, I would love to see that implemented, uh, so that there's a critical juncture within the within a particular set sooner. Um, uh, you know, beyond that, Steve, it's the it's the age old issue of getting all of the competing entities to sit in the same room and come up with something that's not only comprehensive, but is logical and cohesive in terms of growing the game around the world, rather than having you know uh, different entities fighting with each other or competing with each other in terms of the calendar terms of players and so on and so forth. And I, you know, I get the sense that the ATP and the slams and the women's tour are starting to um, have better conversations around that. But I think, you know, the biggest issue is a, is a comprehensive structuring of the calendar to uh, really 
benefit tennis and promote tennis around the world in a, in a cohesive, sensible way. No, that's a great answer. Actually, I, I really don't know Buterak. I talked to him a couple times at tournaments. He, he really helped uh-huh. out Raven Claussen, one of our students. I've been yeah. with us for five yeah. years because, and they had a magical run where they got to the Australian <clears throat> Open final. But you, as you know, they right. allow more teams in a Grand Slam, or I should say a major. I think we get that term mixed up. A Grand Slam is not, a major is a major. Yep. You got to win four to have a right. big Grand Slam. But um, right. where Eric, uh, you know, they got out, out to the finals and afterwards they had some losses and. They, they separated, but that really, Raven was 29 years old and he had, or he had three knee operations. So I always say that, you know, Eric threw him a bone and it really helped him out so much. But but he, like yeah. yourself, uh, um, I, I guess, Division three kid. Division three. Yeah. You got to love it. Um, with uh, yeah. with books, um, that's on a lot of podcasts. Uh, a couple of books come to your mind that you, you think would make an impact. Uh, you know, what we're trying to do, we have uh, courses online and all sorts of Instagram and Facebook clips, and we've been giving out mm-hmm. free content for over 15 years. But what a few, yeah. a few books that come to mind um, that uh, you think would help, help, whether it's a tennis parent, tennis player, tennis coach? Mm-hmm. Um, well, I, it, it's not so much a tennis book as it is, you know, a... Uh, uh, a book about people who are successful, but Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers, um, and understanding really what goes into um, all the different factors that go into becoming, um, you know, highly successful within a particular endeavor. Uh, you know, obviously, we're talking about tennis. Uh, that's a book. Uh, you know, one of the instructional books. Um, that I always go back to is Peter Burwash's very first book. Um, and while the, the evolution of the technique of swing has changed dramatically since then, he, he talks about the racket face and its impact on hitting a tennis ball in a way that I've used um, with beginners all the way to touring pros. Um, you know, I, I, and I laugh, there's a, there's a quick story about working with Eric Buderak and he, he came to me and he said, I'm really struggling with my forehand volley. And I said, well, come on down, you know, we'll, we'll work on it for a while and, uh, then we'll, you know, go, we'll go play nine holes of golf. And, and we started hitting and he comes up to the net, starts hitting forehand volleys and he hit 10 perfect volleys into the top of the net, like literally right on the very top, top of the net. And I looked at him and I said, Eric, you know, there's nothing wrong with your volley. You're just hitting it low. And he looks at me and is like, really? <laughs> this is what I'm paying you for? Um, I said, you know, just hit it a little higher. He then must have hit a 100 perfect forehand volleys to the baseline in a row. And after about 20 minutes, I said, you know, okay, let's go play golf. Um, but that was a well be that was a Peter Burwash concept. Um, in that ultimately, you know, the ball's on some level, the ball's going to go where the racket face is, is pointed. Um, and a lot of tennis is quite honestly as simple as that, Steve. Um, uh, ultimately, yeah. you got to get the racket face in the right position. There's a lot of things that go into doing it, but, um, Ultimately, that's that's the end piece of it. With uh, working so. backwards, Peter Burwash sadly just passed away not too long ago, and he's one of our yeah, peers. Yeah. He was the first. Yeah. He was the first to show up at his two-year school, Tyler, Texas. Uh, yeah. came, came on his own nickel, but that his phrase I use it all the time: racket hit awareness. And today, where people are mistaking the recovery as the follow through. And it's just amazing. You get to the contact point, people are saying, turn the doorknob and the windshield wiper. And, yeah. you know, the ball is going to go the way the strings face. I mean, just, that's a great phrase. It's racket yeah. head awareness. Uh, Gladwell's yeah. book. Uh, I remember, and I tell people, I, I got to the last page. It just, that, <clears throat> that same moment just went right back to the first page. And I, I do think the, the phrase story of circumstance 
Um, you know, like yourself, the way the brain works now, and there's been so much research on the brain. So someone who starts to play tennis at 13 and you're playing all these other sports, um, mm -hmm. you know, and you're playing some kid who's, you know, even though they may have only specialized in one dimensional baseline tennis, but they've been doing that since they were five. I, I think right. pe people just need to evaluate their set of circumstances. And, you know, the, I, I just love all the, the mind vitamins, you know, the, your competitions, yeah. your competitions in the mirror, all the woodenisms where, you know, you never try to be better than your opponent. Here's one uh, last question. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, after your son Christo was with us, we sent him to Dave Anderson, and I never had a chance mm -hmm. to meet Anderson's father, but and I, I probably have it wrong. Um, I spent my life, I spent my whole life saying the right things to the wrong people. That's kind of, <laughs> that, my, my father used to say all the time, you know, um, cream comes to the top but so is bs if you stir it he used to also say if, if you chop wood all day you'll be have a pile of wood uh from your father or mother i mean if people go back and listen to our chuck creasy podcast i mean we we, yeah. need, we need to go back and, and write down chuck creasy going my mother used to say what are some sayings <laughs> uh, obviously you, you've had a lot of success in different chapters of your life um and, and obviously we're about tennis um what are some sayings that your parents said to you you're a kid. Uh, you know, they, they. I'm not sure there's a specific saying, but I, I think the lessons that um, you know to work hard. Um, once you make a commitment to do something, you follow through on it, um, and really a sensibility that uh, nothing is owed to you. Uh, you got to go out and 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 work and make it for yourself. Um, and don't expect people to, to, to just give it to you. And I think those were, you know, some of the foundations to, to the hard work. Both of my parents were very, were, are, my dad just passed away this year, but he was very competitive athletically as, as was my mom. So there was a lot of, uh, sort of modeling for the, for the competitiveness along the way. But I think it was, you know, those those simple foundational pieces, Steve. Of it's not going to be easy, um, and you got to keep showing up every day, and don't expect anyone to give it to you. And that doesn't mean that you're not going to accept help along the way, you know. But I promise you, a lot more help comes your way when people see you as a hard worker, and focused, and diligent, and so on and so forth. People want to. People want to come help you, you know, when they see that. So those were sort of the foundational pieces that my parents gave me. Yeah, those are some, some great words to end on. Um, no, I really appreciate you uh, taking time to be on our podcast. Uh, what I say is, you know, uh, golden nuggets for one's tennis treasure chest. And certainly you've shared a lot of those with yeah. us. But I think there yeah. should be a book. Um, I, I think of Bob Carmichael. I don't know all your tennis travels if you knew but the late Bob yeah. Carmichael. But, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, he started playing tennis at 21 and it, you know, he was, he, he did come from Australian football. He, he did, yeah. he threw his, he threw his name in the hat to try boxing. So he's a really a, a tough cookie. He had done an apprenticeship as a carpenter. That's where they called him nails. I've always thought it was because mm -hmm. he was tough as nails, but I do think today it, it's unfortunate. I, I, somebody, if they're not doing really well in, in tennis at 16, they, they don't think they have a chance, but I think that's mm -hmm. your, your story is so inspirational. You know, to come yeah. from a Division three school in Maine and find yourself, uh, you're, you're at Wimbledon. I mean, that's an amazing, amazing uh, story. Yeah. I'm, I've been blessed and lucky with a lot of opportunities and a lot of people over, over the course of my lifetime, Steve. And now you're a grandfather. It's the best. It's absolutely the best. And another one on the way um, for those people going through the, the throes of raising their kids. There's there's a pot of gold on, at the end of the rainbow, and it, they're called grandkids. Yeah, if I can get, uh, if I can get absolutely, I can get this right. Uh, something that you can ponder with: Why do grandchildren and grandparents get along so well? And the answer is they have a common enemy. Uh, <laughs> you, <yeah>. can, <laughs> you can wind them up and just hand them off too. Yeah, that's great. I think with uh, no, so many things. I told uh, Christo that we'll uh, 
have to get him on the podcast too. Um, he, he can reinforce uh, the lessons you gave him, but you gave us a lot of lessons today, but, but thank you so much. Thanks for taking in the time uh, of your day. Well, I appreciate your interest and um, I really appreciate the talks that you've been good luck with all the podcasts moving forward. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. It. We all hope that what we're doing now uh, with free content, uh, you know, just trying to carry the torch. I mean, someone like a Vic Braden, for example, <laughs> You know, he was re- he's remembered as a short, fat, funny guy, and he was just so misinterpreted. You know, mm-hmm. you really, uh, you have to turn to science and logic and common sense. And I think, right. I think a lot of ways that's, right. that's going away, not just from tennis, but going away from society. Yeah, yeah. But again, thanks a lot. Yeah. Fantastic uh, okay. discussion. All right, bud. We'll be in All touch. Right. All right, thanks. Much appreciated, Steve. Yeah, adios. Okay, take care. All right, bye. Bye-bye. Listeners, thank you very much for hanging in there. Uh, I don't think you have to hang in there with a podcast like that. It's not, not really the best phrase, but class act, class story, uh, podcast 128 in the books. Everyone now thanks to Bud Schultz and everyone thanks for listening. Adios, amigos.